please welcome Stephanie Strom, Jennifer Harris, Julie Manella, and Dean Ornish. So good morning, everyone. Um, I just first want to make sure that you all have one of these little taste packets. All right, just hang on here, OK? We're going to do something fun with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have been sort of surprised uh, over the last five years to find out that school lunch has become one of the most contentious issues in America. Uh, the school lunchroom has really become a battleground, as even though we know more about how you, the establishment of a good diet early in your life is so important. There are lots of disagreements over what's a healthy diet, what a good lunch is comprised of, how to get kids to eat a good lunch, right? It's a, it's a really big problem. So we have three wonderful panelists. We have Dean Ornish, who is an expert on healthy diets and was uh, very active in helping President Clinton uh, establish good rules around healthy lunch. Um, we have Julie Manell from the Manell uh, organization, and we have uh, Jennifer um, from the Rudd Institute. I'm sorry, I'm going to get your name here, Jennifer. Jennifer Harris from the Rudd Institute, uh, who is an expert on marketing to children and the impact of food marketing on children. So, um, Julie, do you want to sort of Tell us what we're going to do with these taste trips. Sure. I, good morning. What I want to demonstrate to you is the part of the plate that often gets uh, the most talk, and that is the vegetable part. So this demonstration is for two things. First, I want to show how we all live in our own sensory world. So take the strip of paper out. <laughs> Anybody want one? Place it on your tongue. <laughs> And if it tastes like paper, raise your hand. If it tastes, tastes like a paper? little paper? Paper? What does it taste like paper? If it tastes a little bitter, raise your hand. If it tastes really bitter, raise your hand. <laughs> the ability to detect this bitter relates to how you're going to perceive a whole class of vegetables, the cruciferous <coughs> vegetables, broccoli, the burn of mustard greens, radishes. And it shows how we're all living in different sensory worlds. If you were to place this strip on your tongue when you were a child, it would, for those of you who tasted it, it would even be more bitter. But the point that I really want to make is, of those of you who taste bitter, how many do you like broccoli, and radishes, and kale, and mustard greens? And that's the second point. Your biology isn't your destiny. You can learn to like these foods. The learning is, more, is easier. When, it's, uh, when it begins early in life and when these foods are part of the family and the diet of the mother, in contrast to a much slower learning when the child is, is older. So that's the point that I'd like to make, is not only are you living in different sensory worlds, but so is the child, but these sensory systems, looking at all the broccoli in the world isn't going to make a child like broccoli. They have to taste it to learn to like it, and that begins early in life. So um, I thought we were going to have a picture of the, the ideal school lunch plate up here. Does anybody know where that is? Ah, there it is. OK. So um, I would love it if you guys would each start out by telling me what you might change about that lunch plate in order to improve the school lunch. Um, and in what, you know, if you'd change the proportionality, um, if you would change you know, what kinds of fruits and vegetables you might put on. Um, Dean, do you want to start? Why don't you go first? You want to? <laughs> <laughs> this is a surprise question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have any arguments with that plate, but mm -hmm. what I would <clears throat> like to emphasize is that that's what kids should be eating, and that's what we should be serving to kids, not a plate that has more protein and a lot more saturated fat and... Uh, fewer fruits and vegetables. So. And so how often do we actually see that plate in the school lunchroom, do you think? Um, I, well, I, I don't know. I mean, the school lunch right now, they, kids are required to take either a fruit or vegetable. Um, in the past, they only were serving one of the two, required to serve one of the two in the school meal. Now they have to offer 
both of them, but kids only have to take one. So um, I would guess the plate doesn't look like that too much. Okay. I think I would change what's not on the plate. And I think what you see, especially when it comes to fruits, is the reality is by the age of two, a child is more likely to eat a manufactured sweet than a fruit in this country. Um, and so there are many things that are competing with the good nutrition that's on the plate. And I think if we were to address these issues, which to give the greatest gift we can give children is to get them to like healthy foods because it is lowering the risk of disease. There's no doubt about that is to talk about what's not on the food and also these plates, not just in the school, but at the home. Um, so that's what I would do. Okay. Dean? Yeah, well, the, it's such a broad thing. I mean, fruits, grains, vegetables, and protein, you know, can be junk food or they can be really healthy food. It really depends on where they come from. If it's processed, if it's, you know, high sugar, high fat, uh, high salt, it's, you know, not so healthy. So I think that within that context, to the degree it can be more plant-based, uh, you know, that would be my preference. But if you want, I can kind of broaden that into kind of how I got into this whole area of uh, food policy and school lunches as well. Well, sure. Let, let me just ask one question, though, first. When we're talking about fruit, this has always been a question. Is this like um, a, a raw apple that we're talking about, or is it a... Uh, fruit cocktail that comes in a sugar syrup out of a can. What kind of, I mean, what's the fruit? Well, that's, um, that's a perfect example of what I referred to a moment ago. If it's fruit cocktail, not so good. If it's a whole apple or a whole fruit, it's great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tom Harkin spent a, a billion dollars a few years ago trying to get organic fruits into schools. Mm -hmm. And he was so amazed, particularly in the lower socioeconomic schools, that people had never tasted how good a, an apple is or a, a fresh organic strawberry. It was like candy to them. And so there's so many misconceptions that kids like junk food better than whole foods when in fact it's really not true. Okay, okay. So um, the, 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 we've all seen these photos, right, of um, garbage cans filled with discarded fruits and vegetables. That was right after they changed the rules. That was the story in the media. Nobody's eating this stuff. Is that really what was happening? And if so, then what is needed to you know, get kids to eat the fruits and vegetables that they're now forced to put on their tray? Well, the research actually shows that that um, reality is not the truth. The, there was a lot of food waste before the new standards went into effect, and there's just as much food waste now as there was then. So the research really shows that. And the um, other interesting research is with school officials who say that their kids do like the, school, the new school meals. So um, unfortunately, I think that's a case where the, the press has really hyped the um, food waste and blamed it on the standards when that hasn't been the case at all. Okay. I would say that you, if a child is first getting these foods when they're in school, you have to expect waste. They learn through repeated exposure in a very positive context, and it's, uh, the acceptance of these foods is much higher when these foods are part of the family. And for the child that's just getting their first taste of broccoli, children eat what they like. And so to in increase the palatability, whether it's how these foods are prepared, uh, but it's going to take time, and I think we're seeing the benefits of time uh, for children to learn to like these foods. And, and there's some of its misconception. You know, uh, it's how, a lot of it has to do with how these are presented. If you present the eat your vegetables, they're good for you. That immediately is a turnoff for grown-ups as well as for kids. But you know, what I'd love to see is the large food companies who have all these celebrities on retainer anyway, make it fun and sexy and cool and hip and crunchy and convenient to eat and live more healthily by making it aspirational, you know, to, to, to say these are things that make you feel good, you know, they help you study better. I mean, studies show that kids in good school lunch programs, their, their test scores go up, their truancy goes down, all the good things uh, begin to happen. And so, so we need Kanye for broccoli. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, why not? And, and, and get away from this idea, is it fun for me or is it good for me? You know, am I going to live longer? Is it going to seem longer? All these false choices and say that, you know, these are things that, that really, these are foods that taste good that also make you feel good and look good. Do kids really uh, care about or have any recognition that a food, you know, that this is a, an issue of health? necessarily, or is it really just for them school lunch? 
think it depends on the age. And for the young child, it's how it tastes that's the most important determinant of whether they eat it or not. And so palatability becomes a, a, a big issue when it comes to the very young child. But you know, I think that's part of why the, um, the, the well, we can talk more about the, the policy issues, but a lot of these tastes are malleable. And studies have shown that if you can introduce kids to healthy foods at a young age, they prefer them. So this idea that broccoli tastes bad is not necessarily true if kids are introduced it early in life. And how early does that have to be, though? Is that, do they hit school in time for us to train the palate? Oh, yeah, even grown-ups. I mean, most grown-ups have had the experience of eating less salt in their diet or if they drink milk to go to low-fat or skim milk. You know, and the food, the, at first the food tastes like it needs more salt and it tastes fine. You go out to dinner and it, suddenly the food tastes too salty. And salt is one of the four basic you know, food tastes that you have. So even as adults, these tastes are malleable. But the sooner you can introduce kids to healthier foods, as soon as they start to eat solid foods, the more they begin to, to prefer them. And the learning about these foods is occurring before your first taste of food. The flavors of the diet of your mother are being transmitted to amniotic fluid That's and right. the mother's milk, and babies are more accepting. That's the earlier you start, the better, That's right. and especially when these foods are part of the family. So I would say, although school is the uh, heart of health, one cannot negate the other parts of the child's life, which really play an important role, especially the home. And I would just add that I think there's a common misperception that you can teach kids about good nutrition and that will make them like nutritious <laughs> foods because all the research we've done shows that kids really know what's healthy and what's not, but they pick what they like. And if they like healthy foods, they're going to eat more healthy. If they don't like healthy foods, they're not. And they've got sensory systems that are really making them vulnerable to manufactured foods. They have heightened uh, preferences for sweet and salt. And so the child not only is vulnerable to a lot of marketing, but their biology makes them vulnerable to these other items that aren't on that plate. So Jennifer, would you tell us a little bit about the, um, how, the role that large food manufacturers play in the school diet and the influence that they have? Sure. Well, because of food manufacturers, pizza sauce is a vegetable. Um, but I think what we're seeing now, which is disturbing to a lot of people, is the standards have gone into effect um, this year on foods that are sold outside of the school meal program. So they're called competitive foods, things <laughs> in the vending machine. Told you this was contentious. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what the food manufacturers have done is created new products that meet the school food standards that look an awful lot like the junk food that's for sale in the, in the store. There's whole grain Pop-Tarts. There's reduced fat Doritos, and now that's what's in the vending machines in the schools. And so, you know, that's really for the companies a great marketing ploy because now they get the perception that they're healthy enough to be in schools and they're continuing to market the junk to the kids. So it's a shame. Dean, you, you worked with the Clinton administration. How hard was it to kind of fight that influence. Yeah, it was part of my journey into uh, understanding the perverse incentives of food policy. I, I, <laughs> um, I, in 1993, shortly after uh, Bill Clinton was elected president, I met with Hillary Clinton and she asked me to work with the White House and Camp David and Air Force One and Navy chefs, mess who, chefs who cook for them. And then that led into uh, Bill Clinton asking me to work with Ellen Haas, who at the time was the Under Secretary of Agriculture, to try to update the guide, guidelines for the school program for the first time in 50 years. And I thought in my naivete that this is something that really could bring everybody together because everybody wants their kids to be healthier. But I was wrong. Uh, she really made a lot of progress, but met a lot of opposition both from the school lunch program because it really has the two divided goals. One is to provide school lunches, but the other is to subsidize agriculture. So they spent $800 million a year at the time buying up mostly meat and dairy, for the, which they then put into the schools. And so the idea of reducing the amount of, of meat and dairy in the school was kind of hit, hit that wall. And the meat industry in particular was afraid that kids might lose their taste preference for meat, which of course was the whole point, um, and then they wouldn't eat, eat as much meat as they got older. And so that became a problem. And then the food service workers themselves thought it was too complicated to, to do this. So they met a lot of opposition there. Uh, and, and so, it, you know, it's unfortunate, but um, these are the kinds of things that, that uh, 
one doesn't really think about and yet really make a huge difference. So how long did it take to, to move the needle even just a little bit? Well, it's been moving a little, and I have a passion for this because you know, over the last 38 years, I've done research showing that these same simple changes in diet and lifestyle can reverse heart disease, can reverse type 2 diabetes. Mark Bedman spoke eloquently that you know, this is going to be the first generation in which our kids live a shorter lifespan than their parents, mostly because of things like diabetes that are completely preventable that can reverse early stage prostate cancer by extension breast cancer, that can change over 500 genes in just three months, that can even begin to reverse aging by lengthening telomeres, ends of our chromosomes that, 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 that uh, control how long we live. And so clearly if we can start earlier in life, then that's a much better way to approach that. So what are the challenges that the school... And, by, and let me say one more thing before I forget. And so later in 2005, I was able to bring together Bill Clinton, uh, Steve Reinemann, when he was the CEO of PepsiCo and the then president of the American Heart Association to talk about can we get, since we can't eliminate the vending machines in schools, can we get them to put, you know, get out the sugar sweetened beverages, put in water and bottled water and things like that, healthier snacks and so on. Uh, a lot of the schools get a lot of their revenue from them, but you know, if you could sell healthier foods as opposed to junk foods, then they still make the revenue. And that led to the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. And as I get older, I'm just looking for even incremental changes on a large scale that can make a difference, and I think this is one of them. So, so what are the challenges that the average school administrator, lunch administrator, would face as he or she tried to improve the quality of school lunch? Well, the resistance from, uh, well, it used to be because they thought, well, we, we, we'll lose our uh, money for our extracurricular activities that come from the vending machines. But then they found that people were buying these healthier products uh, in the vending machines. So that didn't really seem to be an issue. And I think as, you know, one of the great things about the free enterprise system is that if enough people are concerned and care about their kids, then that makes a difference. Soft drink sales have been going down steadily, you know, even without a soft drink tax. Um, parents are concerned about the quality of, of the lunches that, that are being served in school. I think some schools are, are becoming more responsive to that. And I, I, I love the call to action that, that Mark was saying in his speech about, you know, if we, enough concerned people get together, then we can really make a difference. And these are things that really should transcend ideology because, you know, any parent would jump in front of a train for their kid if they thought it would help them. And as we know more and more that, you know, what constitutes a healthy way of, of living, there isn't really that much debate around, you know, there are things around the edges, but the main part of what con constitutes a healthy way of living, I think there's a general consensus around that, and that's something we can all get behind here, and that's why I'm really thrilled to see this conference here. So Jennifer, what do you, what do you see when you yeah. talk to these? Well, the school administrators have, and the food service directors have a really tough job. I mean, they have a very limited budget. Um, a lot of times they don't even have cooking facilities at the school, so to create fresh fruits and vegetables is extremely difficult. Their suppliers don't give them the kinds of foods that, that um, they need. The kids, you know, tell them in their face they hate this stuff and they throw it, you know, in the trash, which, by the way, is not new. It was around when I was a kid. Um, so it, it's difficult. And, it, and the other difficulty is that when you change something midstream like they're doing, you're, you're going against the habits and the expectations. And, you know, once kids, once the kinder, kindergartners start, this is all they know. For them, it's going to be a much easier transition than for, you know, someone who's in middle school who's always been able to buy chicken nuggets and french fries and now can't. You know, it's, it's going to be a while, but it's worth it. It'll definitely improve. And one of the things that always fascinates me as a business reporter is how much things cost, right? And so, you know, to put an organic apple on a tray is a lot more than to put canned fruit on a tray. So how, how are we going to address the cost issue of improving the diet? You know, back in 1999, 2000, I consulted uh, the CEO of McDonald's, took a lot of flack for that, but I figured let's just go into the heart of darkness here. And, um, <laughs> to get them to put salads on the menu, which they did, and to take the trans fats out of their french fries and reduce the sodium and things like, again, incremental change on a large scale. They have 43 million customers a day. But because of the perverse food incentives that you, you alluded to and that Mark talked about earlier, the salad was 5.95, the burger's 99 cents. So if you're on a fixed income, you get a lot more calories for your dollar by eating the junk food because of these perverse subsidies in the farm bill that subsidize the foods that are, that are poisoning our kids. Well, yeah, and in, in fact, those salads make up a very small slice of McDonald's sales. 
I, I know this. Yeah, it's true. Um, but in part because, uh, you know, they're, they're priced out of the market of what most people go to McDonald's can afford. So is it a matter of supply and demand then that we have to make, we have to make really, you know, lettuce less expensive somehow by growing No, it's, it's that we have to stop making the foods that are so toxic cheap. You know, we subsidize the high fructose corn syrup. We subsidize the meat, you know. Uh, we don't subsidize the fruits and vegetables. It should be the other way around. So if we could go back to taste for just a minute, are there things that schools could do to increase um, the likability, if you will, of broccoli or cauliflower or, or carrots? Um, is there like preparation things they can do and how easily can they do those things? I think some of the um, school districts that have done this the most successfully are the ones who bring in um, chefs to help consult with the menus, to help work with the food service directors, to teach them how to prepare the foods, to get the kids involved. So if you do taste, taste tests and have the kids try new foods and vote on what they like, I mean, if you get the whole, um, the whole school community involved and focused on improving kids' nutrition, then it can be a fun and successful endeavor. Yeah, great chefs know how to make great food. And you can make unhealthy food taste bad, or you can make it taste good. You can make healthy food taste bad or good. This is what this conference here is all about. By bringing together great chefs, say, work within these guidelines, and then you can make food that's delicious and nutritious. And how likely is it then that the child is going to go home and say, hey, mom, I had this great, you know, caramelized <laughs> cauliflower or whatever. Um, can you do this? Do that. Yeah. Can you make this? Is that going to translate? It's the number one direction, though, is what the child has at home is the biggest predictor of what they're eating still. Um, that's not to say that it's not going to take time. Palatability is a key issue. So as you can see from that demonstration, especially for that child that's very bitter sensitive to reduce those bitter notes, and you can do that with cooking, and that's a, a successful way to try to get children to like the taste of it more. But it's a challenge. It's going to take time. And uh, well, I, I would just also add that parents, the number one reason they eat, they cook what they, what they do is they think their kids will like it. So this is a great example. If the child tries something at school, comes home, then the parents are more likely to try it because they know their child will eat it. Yeah, and studies have shown that's true. So now it's your turn to ask questions. Um, I think there are people with microphones. This is just a great uh, opportunity. I'm a pediatrician, and this is on the front line um, every day trying to get this word out. Um, and I see it every day, you know, what, peop what people are feeding their kids. Um, and it is, you know, I can start with breastfeeding. That's really easy. You get the moms. But it is what the parents and families are eating. So that's what their kids are going to eat. In my kids' school, it's a laboratory school, the biggest change they saw was cutting up the fruit and had parents come in. Mm -hmm. So every lunch they went from having one basket of fruit to they had 10 mm -hmm. bushels of fruit being huh. eaten every day by all the kids. So part of it is it's contagious. And how, right? how, how did they receive that? They loved it. Yeah. Kids, and I think we don't give the kids enough credit. As you said, the kids know healthy, right? So the problem is that's a laboratory school we need to get this out to everybody. So I think the private schools and the places that can bring chefs in, but I would say everybody's a chef. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a grandmother, a mother, a father, somebody who can cook. So it's really how do we take some blame and shame out of what you eat and make it very uh, realistic so that you're not, you can still, so if you had a, you know, a Whopper one day, it's not going to kill you. But if it's every day, that's the problem. So how do we sort of, move the, the, you know, this um, conversation to being accepted. I think one of the best ways is for parents to cook with their kids. It's become a lost art. Most, pe most parents don't cook for their kids or cook with their kids. And if you bring kids into the process, it makes it fun. And particularly if it's healthy, then it can be fun and then people have good associations with it. And I would just add that schools are the ideal place to model this behavior. I mean, you can't teach good nutrition in health class and then serve kids junk food in the cafeteria and think they're going to get the message. So, you know, even if the families are trailing the, the schools, it's where you have to start. We're asking schools to um, 
serve our kids better food, but where are they getting the money? How do we change the food policy so there's enough dollars at school lunch for the, these, these food service directors? We, our foundation funds directly the schools to have better food, but we're doing it privately. How do we get policy to change to get five cents more per every school for every meal every day for every kid? It, it lies in their hands now. If we just stop subsidizing the bad foods and use that same money to subsidize good foods, it wouldn't cost anything more, but it would change the whole game. Yeah. Can you, uh, an organization we support is Food Corps, and I'm just wondering if you've all heard of Food Corps and observed what they do, and if you would just each comment on the impact you think they could have going forward. Do you guys know what Food Corps is? Uh, I heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, Food Corps basically is an organization. It's, um, it's kind of like uh, Teach for America. Mm -hmm. And they send uh, really enthusiastic young people out into schools. And they uh, basically create gardens and um, have, have the kids grow in the garden. And the food gets used in the, in the school lunch system. And they teach, they, they literally teach the children from the ground up what good foods are. They also, they also, <laughs> they also work in procurement with the kitchens and things like that. Mm -hmm. So Health Corps is doing a lot of that work too. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of effort that goes into I, that. I think what it's hitting on is something that's really important and that the school, late, school lunch plate is not just a source of calories and nutrition, it's much more. And when you involve the child in how you make it, and especially when many children are just getting 10 minutes to eat this lunch. School, you know, it's, it, school becomes family as, as learning does. And this learning takes on many, many different ways. And the child is really open, especially to modeling. And so you see that that type of enterprise can impact the child in more ways than just providing the food. And, and just to say one last thing, you know, just to make the point again that the diet that most experts think is the healthiest way to eat, predominantly fruits and vegetables, is really a third world diet. It's the way that people ate before they could afford to eat all the junk food. You know, it's like other countries are now starting to eat like us and live like us and die like us. And in one generation, heart disease and diabetes and cancer have become, gone from one of the lowest to one of the highest in most countries around the world. So again, it's again a function of these subsidies that are, uh, that are creating this problem that we can change if enough people get together and want to change that. I'm, I'm struck by uh, vegetables being referred to as all the same. Uh, I've grown processing vegetables. And we all know the youngest ones and the best ones are worth a little more money. Mm -hmm. But there's always a huge amount and they yield higher that don't taste very good and that fall short. Mm -hmm. And they get called institutional grade, which are sold to prisons and schools. Mm -hmm. And if they're too mm -hmm. poor for institutional grade, they go to baby food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are we teaching kids when we send them garbage that deserves to end up on the ceiling as opposed to vegetables that are worth eating. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Any more? Um, I'm with uh, Recipe for Success Foundation and we work ground up with the kids and it has such a 360 impact, right? Because you can't change the school lunch and all of a sudden have broccoli on the plate if the child's never seen broccoli. Whereas if you're empowering kids with the knowledge to know what broccoli is, and they're more likely to freely choose it. And the other impact, back at home, where mom has a limited uh, budget to buy food, she's not going to take the chance on buying food she doesn't think her kids are going to mm -hmm. eat. So empowering the next generation of food consumers to make those informed choices is driving change on a 360 degree level and educating their palate to like those foods Precisely. that's what really what childhood is about and empowering them with the skills to support it mm -hmm. so not only gardening and being inspired by the garden but learning how to cook and, and, how and to build on what you just said you know for many kids lower socioeconomic levels their school lunch is their main meal of the day and so if they can be healthy, it completely models and reframes that experience. for them. Well, and in, in some cases, right, it's they're getting three. breakfast, lunch, lunch and, and dinner, dinner at school. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. The kids can change their parents. Yeah. I, I, I want to follow up on, on the last comment I, uh, about education in the schools. I, I've been into our middle school where I live to, to demo and work with middle schoolers in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. A lot of those programs of home or now they call it, uh, food and consumer sciences have been phased out. Mm -hmm. right. But 
why are we waiting until the kids are at adolescent age to be having these conversations? Shouldn't we be starting with programs at the younger age? We teach math, science, social studies, English. Some of those skills will never be used by those kids for their well-being, for their life. Shouldn't you know, these conversations be taught at an earlier age? I had to order a manual to help my child teach her Singapore math because I don't know how to teach it to her. But that's a way that I share that with my child. If we start teaching kids and having that big curricular element of their elementary education, that's going to pull parents in. They're going to want to know, what did you do in this class, just like English, math, science, social studies. And you're going to have much more success if you start early. So is there any way to influence that conversation to get it back into the schools curricularly? How do we get educators to see the value in that conversation? You know, it's such a cliche to quote Margaret Mead's fa famous quote about, you know, never, never doubt the ability of a small group of committed people to affect change. That's how it usually happens. And that is how it happens. And I think if enough parents, again, parents will do anything for their kids. I, I have two kids. I would do anything for them. I'm sure most of you would feel the same way. If we can all bring this together, which is why I think this conference has the potential to do that and mobilize the thought leaders that you all are, now is the time to do that. So on that note, we have to exit. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you all, too. Thanks. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure.